The name of my talk is, just because you're paranoid does not mean your phone isn't listening to every word you say. And I want to show you guys my greatest technological achievement for this entire presentation. I created a 1.92 gigabyte PowerPoint presentation. And <laughs> <laughs> so if this thing finishes and we can power through the PowerPoint without my laptop bursting into flame, I think we've really accomplished something. And uh, as last time, I come bearing gifts. We're going to donate all of the hardware that we present to the hardware hacking area outside. So after this presentation, if you want to play with the Cisco phone that we're talking about, you can absolutely do that. The hardware is yours. And we're also going to give away one super snazzy, partially assembled thing poner kit to uh, somebody in the audience. Uh, we'll ask a question during the presentation. And we'll talk about what this thing actually does uh, in a little bit. But a little bit about who I am and what I do. I am now a fifth year PhD candidate at Columbia University's Intrusion Detection Systems Lab. And here are some of my publications that I've put out in the last five years. Um, what I do, I've spent the last five years thinking about ways to defend embedded systems against exploitation. Um, and throughout that time, you know, sometimes I'll talk to a person, they really get what I'm saying. They understand why we need to secure these things. But other times, you know, the folks I talk to have this glazed over look. You know, I can tell they're thinking, you know, this guy's a conspiracy nut, right? What do you mean somebody can hack my printer and what, listen to me through it or what? So the last few years, I've spent some time uh, coming up with examples of exploitations against you know, embedded systems that we find everywhere that have real world consequences. So for example, I came here last year and I presented the HP RFU vulnerability, uh, the firmware modification vulnerability, which essentially allows you to change the firmware on HP printers without doing very much other than just printing to the device. Um, the attack itself was fairly simple to make. It, all it took was a lot of monkey soldering, some reverse engineering, and an Arduino, and some duct tape. But you know, I think we had real impact, because this year, HP released firmware updates to more than 60 models of their firmware to their printers, all fixing this vulnerability. So because of the presentation and because of a community like this one that cares about embedded security, we've made some actual positive influence in the world. So that's, I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah, thank you. And the reason why I care about embedded security is, you know, this. Like in the olden days, right, you had your big bad internet, but you're okay because you have this thing called the firewall, which protected your server against, you know, hacks or kid on the internet, right? And hacks or kid <laughs> sucks because, you know, it wants to take all your marbles and break into your server. And for the longest time, the name of the game was to get through or around the firewall so you can get access at the server and compromise it and have it do some interesting thing and maybe even exfiltrate some information. And that's what the, the network looked like. But if you paid attention to what's actually on this network, it's not just the server and this firewall. You have these things that look like computers, but you know, we call them printers right, and phones. So in 2000 now, if I were to go after this network, um, I would go directly to the printer. I would, for example, use the HPRFU vulnerability that I talked about last year, send a very nice resume that would uh, change the firmware on the printer. And once I get uh, control of this device, I could you know, steal all your super sensitive information that you print out of the thing. But really, that's not my end goal. My goal is to use this as a launching off point so I can go and compromise other computers on your network, like this phone. And once I have access to all of these embedded systems, I can then use these guys to uh, attack the general purpose server on your network. And now if you, you come along and you notice that I've, I've owned your server, what you do is you'll, you'll probably wipe the server. And you know, I'll come back the next day and own you through the phone again, for example. And I can also use these devices to exfiltrate sensitive information out of the network. So I saw this uh, newspaper article. I, this is a Wired article that I saw, I think, in February or March. And the story was that some guy broke into uh, this water pump station somewhere in Texas. It turned out actually not to be the case. But, and you know, these guys are, this guy's very serious about pointing at his computer and saying, I'm going to lock this system down and no hacker's going to get in here. Right? But when I saw this article, I realized that he's not even really looking in the same direction that he should be. Because behind his arm is the device that I would go after if I was able to get access to this network. Uh, I thought it was a, a Cisco phone, but I got this very nice email yesterday saying, based on the curvature of the device, it probably is an Avaya, so I don't know, maybe. So you know, this piqued my interest, and I started looking 
at places that Cisco phones are being used. And it turns out they're being, they're being used everywhere, right? So this is Dwight from the office. This is a very typical corporate phone. Um, and I guess we're in Germany, so this is Dwight's analog <laughs> in Germany, right? Um, I find these phones all over the place in hospitals, okay? And here's a picture of Obama in the Oval Office on his desk, a Cisco phone. And next to him is Biden. He gets nothing because he's Biden. And here's Obama again with a Cisco phone. You can't really see. But notice that the windows are a little bit curved in this picture. And that's because this is a Cisco phone on Air Force One, right? This is Obama's presidential plane. So these things are all over the place. And I showed this picture off at a DARPA meeting a few weeks ago. And I guess it wasn't so funny then, but I think it's really funny. This is our ex-director of the CIA, right? Um, and next to him, right? And he's very happy because behind him you see three Cisco phones. <laughs> and he's really happy because he knows something that I don't know. He knows that these phones are really secure. So I look at the vendor documentation, right? There's a really thick book about why this phone and the whole VoIP enterprise solution is very secure. It has 202 pages to convince you of that. Uh, it, it says, you know, everything is signed firmware, so you get a check for that. Right? Everything has FIPS certified crypto in this phone, whatever that means, so that's another check. There is a secure operating system, right? undisclosed, proprietary, but it's good, so that's okay. Um, there is Java, right? So this is... Well, when this was written, you know, this was 2002, so, you know, having Java in, in the thing made it secure and it was great. Um, and, you know, there's a minimal attack surface, and uh, the whole thing has secure admin interface, meaning HTTPS and SSH, which we'll talk about. Um, but if you get past all the vendor speak, this is what you're looking at, okay? At the heart of the whole thing, here is not really a phone, but it's a general purpose computer put into this plastic case that makes it look like a telephone. At the heart of this computer, you have two chips. On the left, you have the suspension flash chip, and on the right, you have the system on the chip, a SOC, rebranded by Cisco, but it really is this Broadcom BCM 1100 VoIP engine. This is really the only image I was able to find about this chip open on the internet. Um, but if you break it down, okay, this is what you have. You have the SOC, and next to the SOC you have Flash. You know, they call it ROM, but it's really not ROM. Uh, you have some RAM, and you stick an Ethernet Phi on it, and you get a computer. And if you change the SOC, okay, change it to a Marvell, this will give you the HP printer that I talked about last year. <laughs> But what makes this thing a phone is the fact that there is a hardwired microphone attached to it. And there is this little switch that is here that tells it when the handset has been picked up. It's called the off-hook switch, right? Now, that's what the hardware looks like. Let's look at what the software actually does. It does sign everything. So when the phone boots up, it verifies the signature on the loads that it runs. Um, so that's true. On top of that, it also checksums every file. So you know it does both things. Um, and like the name suggests, it is a Unix-like environment. So this thing we're working with is called CNU, which stands for Cisco Native Unix. Uh, and it, you know, unlike the printer that I talked about last year, this thing actually has processes. So we're really moving up in the world. Um, it has memory isolation, so different processes have different memory spaces, right? So they're not falling over each other, which is good. And you have non-writable text sections and uh, non-executable data sections. And on top of that, this phone does really have a very minimal attack surface. So all the features that it runs are basically turn off um, at boot time. Although you can enable these features over TFTP, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. And the system is locked down. So the only thing that runs as root on this phone is the init process, which means if you find a vulnerability somewhere in a non-privileged process, you're going to have a hard time getting root on this phone. Um, let's see. And on top of that, it has SSH, HTTPS, and all this good stuff. Right? And I'd like to point out, if you want to play with the firmware images and the binaries that I'm talking about, you can actually go to this website and download an unpacker that unpacks all this stuff that's been around since, I think, 2009. I think the hosting company here is really terrible, so half the time the site is down. But the link isn't broken, so keep trying. Um, OK, so let's talk about some of these security features and what it really means. Okay? Uh, it has 100% signed firmware, which is good, but this thing is really only applied at boot time which means after the phone boots up, you can log in and download any binary you want and download it to the temp directory over TFTP and execute it. So you still get ex arbitrary execution on this phone, just not while it's booting up. 
So that's not very useful. Um, and then on top of the, ver the signature verification, all the important files are checksummed. But Etsy password is one of these files. And if you notice, Etsy password contains the default user, right? The password is user, I told you a big secret, um, that is guaranteed to be on every Cisco phone. If you want to disable this, this account, you actually can't do it because the phone will notice that you've modified a file that's not supposed to be modified, and it will restore the default user and pa password on the phone. So can't get rid of this. This is guaranteed to be on every single Cisco phone that you come across. Can't change it. Uh, and if you change that, you've broken signature verification, right? So that voids your warranty. Um, and then there's SSH. There's so much laws in the SSH that we're going to save it for a whole different independent section of the presentation, but we'll get back to it. Just want to say, SSH here, the way it's implemented, makes it actually worse than having Telnet. So <laughs> we'll talk about that. OK, I'm going to hand it over to Mike, who's going to talk about our initial attempts to break into this bad boy. So let's start talking about exploitation of the phone. So the first thing that we tried to do was a very upfront, front door way of getting it where we were just going to try to SU to root. Okay, and so as Ong just said, we have a uh, well-known, it's on all the Cisco forums and Cisco documentation of username default, password user. So we thought, well, maybe they do the same thing for root. So that there's going to be we log in as root, and we have this device vulnerability scanner that looks for default well, or well-known default usernames and passwords. So we try things like root and Cisco and the very Cisco or very secure Cisco one two three, but it turns out that we can't actually get into the phone this way because we were met with actually not a password prompt but a challenge and response prompt. So the next logical step is we try to break challenge and response. So the way that we go about breaking challenge and response is first we get the login binary that again we were able to uh, get through this really nifty unpacker uh, and we load it into IDA. And so we do the, the typical reverse engineering tricks of we start looking for regular strings and we finally come across um, this very interesting function that does challenge and response. And the challenge and response uh, function and basically, it generates a, a random challenge, and it also comes out with a corresponding response. One of the, the things that led us there was this really interesting string uh, called Dick and Jane. It's not actually Dick and Jane. It's something similar to that, but we didn't want to infringe upon anything. So that is used as either some padding or as a seed to the, to the challenge. We're not actually quite sure, but there's more, more interesting is that there's this super secret table in there, which looks something like this. It's just a bunch of, of upper case, case letters strung together, and, and it actually turns out just to be the English language uh, alphabet six times and randomized differently each time. And then, of course, there's some randomness in there. That's in the challenge. So basically what we have here is this, this static system that doesn't have any per device configuration so that we know that if we can reverse the algorithm that they're being used here, that it could apply not only to the phone that we're working on, but across all of the Cisco CNU phones. So we take this, we take this algorithm, we turn it into Python, and we fail again. So what we get is the, we have the challenge, we send it the correct response, and we're told that this account is currently not available. Um, and the success sort of is just some Python debugging. And I mean, really, we shouldn't have been too surprised by all of this, because if you remember the Etsy password file from before, you see that root shell has been the login. But this is a proprietary secure operating system, and maybe they're doing something a little bit different than traditional Unix. So we were, we were stuck at this point. So we tried the direct route. We tried the somewhat indirect route. So now we come to a crossroads of what are we going to do next. So we, as Ong had said, we're allowed to upload whatever we want to on the phone and execute it. So we thought that that would probably be the next logical low-hanging fruit in the, the Cisco CNU uh, exploitation um, uh, range. And so we had just come, so the time frame of doing this was August, September of this year, and we had just come back from, from DEF CON where we heard Charlie Miller's talk on near field communication, and we were really impressed with his fuzzing techniques, so we decided that we're going to get fancy and we're going to start syscall fuzzing. And so we have this binary that we can load onto the phone, and we can have it do syscalls, and so that's going to get us close to the kernel and hopefully find us some exploit. So in order to have um, a system fuzzer, first we need a fuzz driver, and this is just a piece of Python that's running on one of our laptops. 
and then there's a corresponding fuzzer stub sitting on the phone. Now, the fuzzer stub is the login binary that we had become very familiar with, it, with at this point, so it's carved up and our fuzzing code is spliced into it. And the fuzz driver uh, interacts with the fuzz stub via uh, either SSH or the console connection on the phone. So, and of course, we're going to be interacting with the kernel here through syscalls. So what the fuzz driver does is it generates a fuzz case. Uh, and it sends that fuzz case over to the, over to the fuzz um, receiver, which from that generates a system call, which then makes the system call, and then we check, ha does something bad happen? So if something bad does happen on the phone, a kernel panic, the phone very usefully saves a core dump. So after the phone is finished rebooting, then we're able to get the core dump and look at the values of the registers and see what was going on on the phone. And also gives us a list of the system calls that actually crashed the phone. So this is a list of all of the system call numbers on the Cisco phone. The ones in green here are all of the ones that are actually implemented. There's code behind them. There's actually system calls associated with them. All of the other ones are no sys. The ones in red are ones that actually cause kernel panics. Now, <laughs> one of the things that I should have mentioned going into this is while we said that it was a fancy sys fuzzer, it was really naive. So basically, all we did was, even for system calls that would require more than one um, user argument, we only gave it one, and that argument was always eight zeros, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what we have here is 364 total system calls, where 173 of them are actually implemented, and 60 of them cause kernel panics. So we don't actually have time for a demo. We do have a demo here that we can show either later on or, or afterwards. But so at, at this point, we, we now think we know where we're going, but do we, so again, we find ourselves at a, yet another crossroads. Do we, do we try to build a more sophisticated sysfuzzer and go after, after system calls in a more intelligent, sophisticated way? Or do we uh, start looking at the system calls themselves uh, in IDA? For that, I'm gonna pass it back to Ong, where he'll talk about the anatomy of CNU executables and system calls uh, more specifically. Great. Um, and maybe we shall demo of this if we have some time. So we're only 17 minutes in, so maybe we do. Uh, I want to give a very basic run through on how your typical CNU executable works so we can understand how we exploited the kernel uh, a few slides down. So here's your little program. And we're working inside a Unix environment, so this is all very typical. You have your text section where the code lives. And in this case, the code lives at this memory range, 2000000. Um, and there's a second section where the data and the stack and the heap and various dynamic memory uh, constructs live, and it's mapped here. Okay? And this, along with the libraries that it might map, constitutes the user memory space. And uh, on top of that, you have this big green thing, right? It lives at 8008000, which is this typical memory location for where the kernel should live inside MIPS. And uh, this is the kernel. And in this case, we're working with CNU Cisco native Unix version 4.1. So let's talk about what happens when a user land application invokes a syscall. Okay, so I'm a program, I'm running, 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 and I want to make a syscall. So let's say this syscall takes a memory location as an address to a buffer or a struct. So I call malloc, and T1 gets uh, the address of some struct that's allocated somewhere in memory. Okay, I do some stuff to it, I fill some information in, and I load, remember we're in MIPS, I load the value three into register A0. Okay, this constitutes the, this, this is called three that I want to invoke. And I want to move the value of T1 to A1, so this is a parameter that I pass into the syscall. And then all I do is I issue the syscall instruction and a software interrupt happens and context goes between uh, the user land application to the kernel, okay, and in the kernel, there is a thing called the syscall handler, right? It takes argument A0, which we passed it, that's the syscall number, three in this case, and A1 is the, the pointer to some memory, some struct that's inside user land memory. It, the kernel handler looks at A0 and looks up this table called the sysent table, right? It's an entry of all the in, uh, syscall numbers versus, versus the, uh, the pointers to the functions that correspond to those syscalls. In this case, you know, we have syslols. Like Mike said, we changed some of the names around, okay, so that we don't actually violate copyright, et cetera. And I like to point out the, the program says that my name is Stefan Havermeyer, and that's true. So if Cisco wants to sue, please direct lawsuit to Stefan and not Ong. Um, anyway, so we find the location of this pointer, right? It's in T9. Uh, 
uh, we move right T9 to the, the syslog pointer, and we move A1 to A0, and we do a jump and link register to T9, and that's how we call the syscall. Okay, simple. So let's talk about how this syslog actually works. Right, we can't say exactly which one this is, but I will say this is not a vulnerability inside a, a specific syscall. It's a pervasive problem inside the syscall interface, and we found I would say half a dozen, maybe more syscalls that are vulnerable, just like this one. But, so inside the syscall, which lives in the kernel, right, on the left side you have user memory space. Um, it takes A0, which is the parameter passed in from the user line application, right, and this data structure is just two pointers, pointer A and pointer B, which points to yet two other uh, pieces of memory inside user land. Okay, the kernel gets some data structure inside the pointer A, we call it T1, and then T2, and what it does is it copies some data from T1 to T2. Right, so that's, that's how it works, and the syscall ends, and everything's fine. But what happens if we don't play nice, right? You can see where this is going. So we control everything on the user land side, so we still have the point to T1, where this is the source of our, the thing that we want to copy, but T2, let's just point it to the kernel, right? And this is why we call it syslawless, because, you know, it'll continue working like everything's okay, no input validation, so it would happily modify whatever kernel data structure, whatever kernel memory range you want it to which gives us very trivial arbitrary memory modification inside the kernel, which gets us arbitrary code execution, so we own the kernel, right? Which is good. So what do we do once we can modify anything we want in the kernel? Well, we're kind of lazy, so we went after set UID. You know, usually the logic is if I'm supposed to be root, right, set it to one. If not, set it to some other value. So we said, no, let's just set it to one all the time and everything's cool, right? And it, and it worked, so that was the easy part, okay? And the hard part is coming up now. So like the title of the talk said, we want to be able to listen to the phone, right? There's a microphone here. We want to hear what's going on uh, without having anything perceivable happen on, on this device, right? Because intuition is this is a general purpose computer with a microphone hardwired to it, so we should be able to do this. But it turns out this is actually a little tricky because in order to activate the microphone, uh, there, you, there's also this pesky little speaker LED, right? Now this LED is controlled by GPIO, general purpose input output, but I think there's some, p some piece of code inside the DSP firmware in the ZSP chip that's actually checking whether the LED is on before it activates the speakerphone microphone. You know, so we're all super bummed out, right? Like, this is not gonna work, but we're cool kids and we keep trying. And it turns out like, oh, so you can't have the microphone, the speaker mic without turning on the LED, right? But it turns out this phone has two microphones. Duh, right? Surprise. Um, there's, a, there's a handset mic right here. It works fine, you know, I, and there's no handset on LED. The only thing we have to uh, finagle is this little off hook switch here, right? And like I mentioned before, all of these things are general purpose input output, so we should be able to reprogram it uh, and flip it on. And then we would be able to, you know, win and be extra fancy. So. Here's the logical diagram of what I'm talking about, right? Um, you have a microphone that's hardwired. There's no mechanical switch to turn it off, short of you know, unplugging the handset from the phone, which you should do after this presentation. And there is a GPIO, that's the off-hook switch. Now, it's configured for input, but you, know, you can reprogram it to be output, right? Because it's general purpose. And thanks to my friend Michael Osman, he gave me this really cool idea. You can you know, solve two things with one. So you can actually change this so that it, you can reprogram the off-hook state. And also you can turn this into a fontana where you can actually send RF signal out through this approximately eight inch long wire, right? So we haven't done that yet, but I think it'll work. So we're gonna try it at some point after this presentation. Um, Okay, so let's look at you know, how this phone actually works. Uh, there are components inside user land and in the kernel. So in user land, there is the JVM, which runs a Java application, which is responsible for um, displaying the screen, handling native interface, uh, JNI events about button presses, uh, call setup and all this stuff. And there's a user land DSP application that basically is a driver that communicates with the J JVM uh, and the actual DSP chip that you know, configures the microphone, the various codec coefficients and all that good stuff. Um, so in order to pull this demo off, we're gonna have to make three modifications. First, we patch the DSP, then we patch the kernel, and then we patch the JVM. Okay, in the DSP, you have audio path control. So this tells the, JV the DSP chip where audio is coming in, how it's transcoded, and where it's going out, right? Whether it's going out to RTP or it's going out to a speaker, et cetera. 
Um, it also has gain and volume control, right, to say how much gain you put on the input of the audio and how, how loud to display or to, to play back things. And you also have DSP resource managers, right, because this thing can actually do onboard uh, call conferencing, so it allocates how many like, transcoding resources that are simultaneously going on. And it also keeps a collection of RTP sockets. This is UDP sockets used to send data out to the various counterparties that the phone's talking to. So for our attack, the first thing we do is we activate the handset audio path. So at this point, nothing's happened. We've just configured the audio path, like patching the wires so that we say we want to get data from the handset, okay? And then we set various ZSP coefficients to bump up the gain on the microphone. And the last thing we do is we allocate a little RTP socket going back to the attacker so I can hear what the phone's doing, right? At this point, packets aren't being sent yet. But, uh, oh, for, for good luck, we drop a little rootkit in here that, you know, is basically a little conduit that gives us arbitrary uh, memory modification in the kernel over UDP and all this good stuff. So that's the hard part. Uh, and then the last thing, well, the second to last thing we have to do is um, modify the GPIO um, for the off-hook switch pin, right? We configure it from input to output, and we set the thing to high. So we've not physically, but, you know, logically picked up the handset. Last thing we have to do is uh, modify the JVM. Now, the JVM is responsible for a little driver that communicates with a DSP userline program, which then in turn communicates with the ZSP chip. And uh, it also has all the fancy logic for SIP and skinny call setup and all this good stuff. And it also has J and I for button presses and all these interface events. But the thing that we care about is the screen driver. So when you lift up the handset, there's a tiny little handset icon that comes on the lower left-hand corner of the screen. So we don't like that, and we want to disable it. So we patch the JVM, that thing goes away, and we're done. So that's the crux of our demo. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the thing poner. So Mike has one. We're going to give one away. Um, this is a device that I made so that I can walk up to a phone uh, to do a physical attack against um, this device. So imagine, you know, I'm, I'm coming in for an interview, right? You printed out my really snazzy resume. You're, you're reading it, and everything looks good. You turn around, I plug this thing in, and I hit a button on my cell phone. So the thing poner, I guess you can plug it in while I say. So Mike is going to turn on the thing poner, and we're going to plug it to the back of the phone, not the Ethernet port. We're going to use the RJ11 aux port, which does RS-232 communication. It's a console. Uh, port on the back of every Cisco phone. So we connect this guy, and I'm going to use my smartphone to pair to it over Bluetooth. OK, this is basically what the user interface looks like. Uh, once I do that, I hit the Pwn button. And what I'm going to do is, well, first I connect. I don't know if you can see the, my phone here. So I hit, <laughs> and then I hit the Auto Pwn button, OK, which does something very simple. It, Okay, so there's, I hit the auto pwn button. Okay. Now, I guess I'm very brave that I'm doing a Bluetooth demo in front of a room full of hackers. But please be nice. Um, so what this phone is doing is it's trans transferring about 900 bytes of data through Bluetooth uh, to the thing poner, which is then saving that data onto a temp directory, or inside, in the, inside the temp directory, onto the phone itself, and then executing our little exploit, which will give us root access. And once it has root access, it's going to go and patch the various components that we just talked about. And if it worked, maybe. OK, now Mike is going to run. OK, by the way, so check out the phone, right? The exploit just worked. The volume thing comes on sometimes, but it eventually goes away. Um, <laughs> And can we cut back over to the, uh, to the computer? All right, so let's go back to the computer, and this is what, what's going on, okay? And can we also have somebody from the audience, I think we met him just before, come up and, and maybe say something in, in front of the phone, uh, Robert? Just so that we can prove we're not, you know, faking the demo, right? Uh, this phone is actually listening to... Oh. Meet me at 4 p.m. Can you go back to the spectrogram? 
So you can see, you know, the audio quality on this thing is not so bad, right? Like you can you can talk into it and it's slightly louder, but when you put the microphone against the phone like this, you can hear just fine, right? And nothing happens to the phone. So just because you're paranoid doesn't mean your phone's not listening to everything you say, right? And there's no way you can tell whether this is happening or not, because you can actually make a phone call, you know, work just fine. Um, and we'll just leave it on, why not? Right? Let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so that's the thing pointer. And if we have time, I'll talk about this cool little trick that I came up with of sending arbitrary data over VT100 terminal uh, without Kermit. So we were actually able to transmit arbitrary binary and have it execute just with console port. According to Cisco, these are all the phones that are vulnerable. But if you look at their product offering, I think this is basically every single phone that they didn't buy from Tanberg. Right? So this is basically the bulk of their, their product offering. And uh, this is, you know, they called it a local privilege escalation vulnerability. I call it a kernel vulnerability, right? And um, the condition for this is if you run a 7900 and you don't have patch 9.3.1-ES10, which isn't really out yet, um, you're vulnerable. So every Cisco phone you've touched in the past, I don't know, six years, had this bug inside the kernel, right? So think about that. I guess what Cisco is saying is, you know, it's time to patch. And the patch to get is this patch. Uh, Mike will talk about what that patch does in a little bit, but I just want to give you guys an idea of the timeline that this happened. So initial disclosure to Cisco, um, 1024. Then Cisco acts, you know, okay, I've gotten your proof of concept to work two days later. And then, you know, a week later, they come back with, and said, okay, guys, the problem is fixed, right? And Mike and I kind of scratch our heads and we say, wow, they fixed input validation in the kernel in a week. That's really good. Um, so we, you know, it's the paper deadline time, so we're busy writing papers and doing all this stuff. And uh, we get another nice email to say, well, you know, hey, the patch is out. You can get it if you want. I tried. I couldn't really find it on the website. It turns out you have to request it by special request over TAC, and you have to have support. And it's, it's a cumbersome process. But eventually, you know, we get to it. Like two weeks after that, we download the fix. Okay. We look at it. We report the second initial disclosure to Cisco. Uh, like the day later, and there was there was a lot of lulls all around because we looked at the, the patch and saw what it did, um, and then like six hours later, Cisco responds to say, "Well, okay, it works," um, <laughs> but that's actually good. So like, I want to hit the way back web machine and talk about our experience with Cisco. So when I was you know a, a very nice young man starting my PhD career, I along with my advisor Sal, who was in front, wrote this proposal to defend Cisco IOS. Uh, against exploitation. We wrote this very fancy uh, And what did proposal. they say, Ong? Hmm? And what did they say? Oh, it goes to the dev don't care, right? Like, it just went nowhere. <laughs> and then a year later, you know, I did an attack, and then I did more defense work, and I showed that defense actually is plausible. So wrote another really nice proposal, and what also went What did they went say to, this time? Yeah, dev don't care, mm -hmm. right? Like, and then the last one, this May or something, right? Cell and I wrote, hey, let's defend IP phones against exploitation. Surely it changed this time. And uh, this person was actually in our, in our lab, and, and you know, I gave this big presentation about how Cisco IOS is vulnerable, and we can probably protect phones with the same technology we have. And the guy said, yeah, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over phones, you know, whatever. So again, goes to dev don't care, right? We've never been able to get a proposal for IOS or any Cisco product defense in there. And then, of course, you know, you have the rest of the events here, so maybe they'll call me. I don't know. Um, but Mike is going to talk about what the patch does. Okay. So the patch. So if you remember back to several hundred megabytes worth of slides ago, we have this as the, uh, the system call. So we're sending the system call number to A0. We're sending the argument to A1. Uh, we look up the, um, the pointer to the, uh, the actual system call from the system table uh, and store that in T9. And then if you notice before, there was this, this space in, in the slide uh, just before the system call number where we copy the argument to A0 and then we actually make the system call. So what the patch, um, um, what the patch amounted to? Sorry to jump ahead there. What the patch amounted to was, well, we 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 took the the, the new um, the new code and loaded it onto our phone, and we ran our exploit code on it, and it, it crashed the phone instead of giving us the privilege escalation, and then we we thought we made a mistake, so we ran it again and again and again, and it was the same thing. So our our uh, privilege escalation exploit turned into a denial of service exploit. Um, so we started looking. So we started looking. Um, so we loaded the new firmware. Um, into IDA and started looking at it. And so we were going to look, obviously, in two places. So either at syslulls, um, in which um, 
And that was identical, uh, no code change there. So the only place that it, it could possibly change would be in the, uh, the syshandler co code, which we have here. And what the change amounted to was that they said, if the argument you're passing in is greater than 8000 in the uh, upper bytes of the register, then exit the syscall. So if, it's in, if you're pointing at something in kernel memory, then that's bad, stop, exit gracefully. Uh, and otherwise, everything's cool. Um, so just closer up, like this, this, is, this is what the code amounts to. There were a couple other lines in there, but this was the, the primary part of the code. So now the, there's the, the question for the audience in which whoever raises their hand and answers correctly wins this do-it-yourself version one of the thing poner. So why does this not work? Uh, I saw that hand up first, uh, and I, I could be, I'm sorry if somebody else raised their hand first. So what's the answer? It was the, re the red jacket I saw first. Uh, basically, if you feed it the uh, uh, 800 uh, address and precisely that address, you can still overwrite uh, the complete kernel. No. It, not? No, no, no. Uh, so I saw that hand next. I'm sorry, I'm favoring people in the front. And I'm sorry, I'm making you run. Because that would be a very specific part of the kernel that we'd be able to overwrite, and we want to overwrite a, a, an arbitrary spot in the kernel. But, a, but a, excellent guest. A1 is pointing to a structure in user memory. And um, the point is in user memory isn't uh, checked for illegal kernel accesses. Excellent, sir. You just come on up stage, uh, on stage either now or later and, and get yourself a clean poner. So in, um, in case that was, uh, that, was, that was said very well and very succinctly, but just in case the, the audience either here or, or online didn't hear that we are allocating. <laughs> <laughs> that we are allocating a structure in user land, filling it with kernel data, and then passing it to the kernel, thereby making it past the greater than 8000 in the upper eight bytes. And uh, Ong also notices that with the amount of code and between the time that we notify them and the release date, it was approximately one line of code per week. And the, when we notify them of the, the, um, the second one, it was basically take the proof of concept code um, that we had sent them before, uh, increment one of the constants in there by a, a small constant factor and the, the new exploit worked. So let's talk a little bit more about remote attacks instead of just this local attack and then talk about like actual defenses to this instead of just poking like at the kernel and poking fun at the vendor. Yeah, so it's in the pointer, right? Um, so I want to talk about three scenarios for remote attack and they're ordered in the increasing level of snazziness. Uh, scenario number one, let's say this is your, your network, right? You have a voice VLAN, so this is the typical deployment recommendation by Cisco where all the Cisco phones live inside the voice VLAN. You have on this network a phone and also a TFTP server where the, the config files all fetch from the server. And then you have, you know, let's say a lobby phone, right, that's out in the public and a bunch of other phones. On the left side, you have the office VLAN where your desktop lives and your printers and et cetera. So, attack scenario number one, right, local SSH authentication bypass. And this is why I save SSH for later. Here's how SSH server works. So a phone or any other device on the network, uh, usually phones don't SSH to each other, but they do when you own it with a thing pointer, right? Um, will make an SSH connection to this phone here, and what the phone will do, right, is to say, okay, I know how to do SSH, uh, but let me first ask my TFTP server for the authorized keys file, okay? And they do this because every file has to be checksummed, and it's very cumbersome to do this sort of per device a uh, file that has to be, you know, sitting on the phone, you know, that kind of breaks the whole checksumming thing. So this phone downloads the TFTP uh, file, or downloads uh, the authorized keys file along with all of its configuration that turns on and off various services over TFTP, which is, you know, a really secure protocol. Um, the TFTP server will say, okay, got it, here's a file to use, right? And if you have that, you can uh, finish your authentication, and the phone will say, I got two options for you. One, you'll do key-based authentication or password-based authentication. And if you have the key, you get in. If you know the password, you get in. But what if we don't play so nice, right? 
Uh, this time, you know, I've owned the lobby phone through a thing poner, let's say, and I tell the phone I want to do SSH. Okay, and the phone says okay, and then, ah, I send you a little ARP message that says, don't worry, I'm the TFTP server, okay? And the phone says, <laughs> like, okay, that's, that's cool. And we actually have a demo of this, but, you know, we'll show it if we have some time. Um, and so to the phone, I become the TFTP server, right? And I say, ah, oh, look, I have a TFTP or uh, authorized keys file for myself that you should use. The phone will download it and say, ah, oh, what a coincidence, you have this key that you're supposed to authenticate. <laughs> and uh, then it works, right? So this is, you know, I didn't report this as a bug or a vulnerability because, you know, I read the manual. This is the way it's supposed to work. This is how the phone gets authorized, you know, the authorized keys file. This is the heart of SSH authentication. So. Not a, not a hack, right? So that's not very snazzy, according to Cisco, right? But let's talk about scenario number two, where we're doing layer three SSH authentication bypass. By the way, once we get SSH, right, we can do the local privilege escalation, get root on the, on the kernel and all that good stuff. So what, can you do this on layer two without ARP, or layer three without ARP? Okay, probably, right? So let's say I'm the printer uh, that I just own, right, through my resume, and I want to own this phone. I SSH directly to the phone, and I know that this phone is going to ask the, for the authorized keys file. But I know that this is coming, so I send it a whole bunch of UDP packets source spoofing the TFTP server, right? If, as long as I can guess this uh, TFTP request ID, I get to, be, uh, to beat the TFTP server right, to the phone. And as long as I win this race, I still get to get, uh, send my t authorized keys file to the phone. Now, the authorized keys file is just one UDP packet, so this is actually a pretty easy thing to do. And the attacker has the advantage here because we know exactly when the phone is going to make that request, because we know exactly when we made the SSH request, and we know exactly how long it takes the, the phone to generate the TFTP request after SSH negotiation and all that stuff. So we can time this thing pretty closely. Okay, so this is layer three SSH authentication bypass. Uh, you know, that's number two. And number three, I wanna talk about my super snazzy two-stage uh, remote exploit. But the problem is, you know, you saw the patch and how it didn't actually work. So we're not gonna talk about the remote exploit for Cisco phones. Instead, we're gonna talk about uh, the exact same situation for another class of devices, HP printers. But here's the general idea. I mean, this is how we always exploit kernel vulnerabilities, right? You find, you know, any vulnerability in any non-privileged process anywhere on the system, and you execute some code, and that code is gonna be your stage two code, which is then gonna be used to compromise the kernel, right? Like, this is very typical. Um, now, how are you gonna find a vulnerable code inside these other processes? I mean, do they even exist? So let's be lazy about it. And this is data that is in our latest paper in NDSS. It's going to be published in two months, but the PDF is available now. So I encourage everybody to check this thing out. It's got a lot of really interesting uh, details. Um, so we looked at all the HP RFU images that are put out, right? Um, there's, we looked at 373 different images. And out of those, uh, 300 of them had at least one known vulnerability uh, that is at least, I think, six years old in either Z Zlib or OpenSSL. So here's a way you would be able to find a way to exploit some code on these phones, right, without doing too much work. Here's a better breakdown. We're out of time, so I'll super go fast. Um, but let's say Cisco fixed everything and the kernel is now secure, right? Are, are we done? Take a step back and look at the structure of this embedded device. You have a ROM chip, right, which is not a ROM, it's a flash chip. And here's a typical flash chip, okay? And here are all the commands that you can send to it. And the thing that really makes this important is this one-time protection feature. So usually, you know, the vendor of the flash chip will leave a mechanism where, let's say, Cisco can burn in some piece of data into this flash chip permanently, right? And you won't be able to, there's hardware protection against modifying that data after that point. But the reason why Cisco put a flash chip in there, which is more expensive than the ROM chip, is precisely not to use this feature. So I, as the attacker, the first thing I would do is invoke this feature and burn my malware persistently onto the flash boot ROM chip. And from that point on, there's no way you can remove it unless, unless you physically remove that chip. Right? So even if you patch tomorrow, if your phone has been compromised yesterday, right, you, you have something to worry about. Like Mike said, you know, it's easy to poke fun, it's easy to you know, point out flaws of others, but I've spent five years of my life thinking about ways to defend embedded systems. So I want to quickly talk about you know, what I think is a good solution. In my version of a good solution, I want to do something practical, right? which means I want to be able to retrofit existing uh, devices with host-based defense. Right? 
But I want to do a little bit more. I want to retrofit arbitrary devices with the same host-based defense. So we come up with a defense that we all understand, right, is well known, and we should be able to inject it into various devices like phones, printers, routers, and all this stuff. So we have to come up with an operating system agnostic host-based defense. But on top of that, you have to do it in a way that doesn't break functionality of real-time operating systems. So imagine this thing running in a pacemaker or a backbone router where timing really matters. Uh, you also have to do it because we want to be practical with, without hardware modification because unless you want to sponsor national or global trade in your Cisco phone day, right, we're stuck with the hardware that we have. And lastly, to be practical, you're basically going to have to do this from the binary because you're not going to be able to get source code from the vendor. Right? Cisco is really not going to agree to just fork over their source code to the general research community for everybody to make antivirus for them. Uh, it would be nice, but they, I don't think they'll do it. But so this thing does exist. You know, I've, this is what I've been doing for my PhD career. It was invented at Columbia, uh, and it's been funded by various organizations inside the United States, namely IARPA, DARPA, and DHS. And uh, this is how it works. Um, and there are plenty of papers talking about exactly how this mechanism works. So the key insight here is you want to take a step back and just accept the fact that you'll never understand how all of these different pieces of firmware works. But you still want to be able to inject something that's an invariant into all of these. Um, and the way we do that is by uh, analyzing the, the binary and fix, cho choosing a large set of intercept points. So for example, in the Cisco router, we choose anywhere between 15 to 35,000 intercept points, right? And these intercept points, only purpose is to periodically redivert the CPU so we get to run the Symbio payload, which is you know, anything that's computable that will compute some security guarantee for us, regardless of what the host program is doing. Now the idea here is that in, once we've done this, we want to make it so that in order for the host program to execute correctly, right, the symbiote also has to execute, cor execute correctly. Right? And the symbiote will then in turn be used to calculate some security mechanism. So really running short in time, but uh, here is you know, a typical Cisco uh, router with a very simple symbiote injected into it. We did a very first, uh, very naive approximation. We got it to work, but if you look at the CPU utilization, right, it's through the roof, and if you ever run a router, right, this is bad, right? Like you don't want your thing to be packed to 98% all the time. So we went back and we, drew, we made another uh, symbiote scheduler, and this time we we're able to keep the CPU utilization completely flat. And you know, there's a paper talking about how we did this, and we still get the same detection latency, the same performance. Long story short, this turns right, an unusable solution into a very usable solution. And I wanted to show a demo of this phone being protected with our symbiote technology, but you know, didn't really have time. So what we're gonna do is show exactly this phone running the latest Cisco patch, which will still have a, a vulnerability in it, probably, um, running our symbiote defense at RSA in two months. So that's that for my presentation. You know, much thanks to Cisco for making phones. Uh, you know, thank you, Uncle Sam, for supporting our research, and thank you, Columbia, for supporting this research. And also, oh, and here are some useful links. If you want, you can download the Unpacker and Repacker for the CNU to look at the binaries yourself. And if you want instructions to make a console cable for this phone, you can find it here. All right. Uh, thank you, Doug uh, Bingstock and Miguel Yanis, who are my undergrad uh, students who helped a lot on this project. And I also want to thank uh, Travis and Sergey, who is probably here somewhere. Um, see their talk tomorrow and the third day and the fourth day. They're going to be super cool. Um, last thing I want to say is I want to thank you guys because without a community of people that care about the embedded security, I don't think HP would have done what they did, which is spend a lot of effort to fix the vulnerabilities that they have. So I want you to keep making security important. I want you to say that this is not an okay security patch, right? And I want you to go and look at your desk and if you have a Cisco phone, complain to your business people and complain to your system admins. And if you're system admins or business people, I'm sorry. I want you to do the same thing. I want you to go and complain to Cisco and say this kind of you know, treatment of a security vulnerability that affects very many people uh, is not, not okay. So we demand better security from, from these vendors. And uh, that's it. Thank you. We have four more minutes for a very quick round of Q&A, so if you have any questions and you're in the audience, please queue up at the hall and get away, uh, microphones here, and we'll do a quick round robin. Uh, we also have questions uh, from IRC. 
Okay, um, I'll go right ahead. So someone named Bart says that he had a deeper look in, on uh, Siemens Enterprise open stage voice over IP phones and he says that they almost look like the same technology inside and um, that there's also a Unix-like operating system on it. Uh, are there any plans to have a deeper look on different voice over IP, uh, voice over IP phones like open stage or SNON? My advisor is giving me the no, 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 let's, let's write more papers. Um, okay. But I, what I'm going to say is I looked at Avaya phones too, which I guess is their number two competitor, and they use this, almost the same Broadcom chip, and the diagram looks exactly the same. It is also a Unix-like operating system. It's not exactly CNU, it's something different. Uh, so I would expect that the vulnerabilities that we find in this guy to be not just a single case, but it's probably pervasive among yeah, all of these devices. As the community knows that, that Cisco is not unique to this problem, that it's going to be pervasive through every type of device from every type of manufacturer. So this was just the one that we chose to look at because it appears in so many places. Okay, thanks. Next question then, or do you want to go on in the, okay. Um, so uh, someone thinks that uh, it sounded like you, you found some more bugs actually, and uh, he wanted to know if, if there really are more bugs than you were reporting here, and if so, in what part of the system they were. Uh, well, I mean, so like I said, we found vulnerabilities in a whole handful of different kernels. I mean, this is a pervasive problem in the kernel. It's not just one syscall that's the problem. So in that sense, yes, we, we have uh, verified a few more syscalls that are, that are vulnerable. But, you know, so remember I wrote with Mike this very fancy syscall fuzzer that we haven't even really used. So once this first round of uh, vulnerabilities are fixed, we're probably going to fire up the sysfuzzer and see what we find inside the deeper parts of the kernel. Two more questions, uh, one from the audience. Um, yeah, you mentioned the kind of SSH fuck-ups which were by design and not actually problems in the real SSH protocol. Do you think Cisco learned how to implement SSH itself probably? Because in the oh, past they, they didn't. I can say that they didn't. They, they bought <laughs> another server and dropped it in there. So that's one of the third party libraries that I looked at uh, that may or may not have a very old vulnerability that is well known. Um, Okay. But you should go Cisco. Okay. Yeah. But Cisco didn't write their SSH server, it's someone else's. But, but it's not the one that's been in iOS routers. Uh, right? I don't think it's the same as the one in okay. iOS. <laughs> um, I have a more on a comment than a question. Um, okay, thanks. Um, you could uh, probably uh, combine the attack scenario on SSH uh, authentication bypass, uh, the first and the second scenario, you don't have to be on a uh, voice VLAN to make uh, art spoofing. You can just uh, do the VLAN hopping and, and yep, do sure. the stuff, right? Yeah, sure. You could do that. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, second, how much work you put in this, in this whole stuff? Oh my god, I don't even want to say. Uh, so. I spend the last four days nonstop watercoloring on my iPad. Um, and then the, I, I was almost done, and then Mike told me that I misspelled the word embedded wrong on every one of my slides. Because when you watercolor things, you don't get spell check. And I had to redraw like half my slides. Yeah, I, I, I was <laughs> actually wanted to know how much you in, invested in, in hacking this. Oh, one. so I would say. <laughs> I would say almost as much time as I put into this two gig PowerPoint. Uh, no. Um, it, it took about two weeks for us to verify the, the kernel vulnerability, so that was the easy part. I mean, that's the part that I know how to work with. The part of getting a, a demo that worked, I mean, that took maybe a month because everything is undocumented. You know, we had to reverse everything from the JVM, right, to the DSP, to, you know, the Cisco binary executable format and all this stuff. So that, that took the most part of the effort. But, you know, in general, I'd say two months of work. Mm -hmm. Plus all the prep work that we did back in May, you know, writing the proposal to Cisco took some time. But I don't Thank know if you. that counts. Uh, okay, I'm afraid we're out of time. Please give a very warm applause to Ang and Michael. Yeah. Thank you.